Stone Cold, the Hellraiser is back. Here we go. Oh. Evolution of the Shield. John Cena versus the Show. Stop him. Hulk Hogan and The Rock in the same ring. You will never take my place at the head of the table. Undertaker on the Hell's Gate submission. Oh my God. What? My God, Michaels just kicked Cena's head off. It'll be the Rock! It'll be Austin one-on-one! Third and five! Undertaker! Do you believe in Miracle? The streak is I bet you guys haven't heard that theme song in a long time, or if at all, because it's not long, it's not often rather that I come onto this podcast and I record something that our very own Matt doesn't know or don't doesn't remember. And I kind of stumped him when I told him that I would be covering the Invasion pay-per-view from July of 2001 from Cleveland, Ohio at the sold out Gund Arena. And it's a pay-per-view that was a one-time thing, a one-off. They never duplicated it again, which makes it so unique in the history of WWE programming. And I think that in terms of Invasion, we saw a pay-per-view that in a lot of ways and from a personal standpoint was unforgettable because of its uniqueness and the fact that it truly was a one-off. But it was so underwhelming in other ways because obviously if you were a wrestling fan in the late 1990s you were absolutely dreaming of this type of pay-per-view to eventually come to a head here wcw versus wwf and in early 2001 the war as we came to know it finally did come to an end as we had vince mcmahon buy out his competition on the historic programming of monday night raw leading into wrestlemania 17 in houston texas But obviously, as we know, the entire invasion angle did not go according to plan. As we've heard Jim Ross talk about, we've heard many people talk about it who were involved in the WWF at that time. But as we've all kind of broken down the invasion angle in some form of fashion, and I think that we could all agree that it was ultimately a very underwhelming angle, especially when we have you know, dreamed and fantasized about other things that could have gone down during that era. And the primary thing was the fact that the WWF did not get all of the top tier talent from WCW. That first and foremost was the biggest issue working against Vince McMahon and his creative team in the WWF. You didn't get the likes of Hulk Hogan, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash the NWO, the original members. You didn't get Goldberg. You didn't get Scott Steiner. You didn't get Sting. You didn't get Ric Flair. Those, All those guys eventually came back to the WWF or showed up in the WWF, but because of their ironclad contracts with Time Warner, it allowed them to stay home and make the same amount of money. So, Instead of getting a historic best-on-best match of WWF versus the WCW, we got an extremely watered-down version of something that so many wrestling fans had been dreaming of. But be that as it may, we still got a pretty good pay-per-view and a pretty good angle leading into the pay-per-view. So to give you some backstory, Shane McMahon was the on-screen new owner of the WCW. And in my opinion, when they realized that they couldn't get all the top tier talent from WCW, they had to kind of pivot and find another way to even the playing field. And how did they do that? With ECW. And on screen, you already had Paul Heyman with his foot in the door. You had Paul Heyman as the color commentary next to Jim Ross on Monday nights. 
But then in a way to strengthen the WCW narrative or the ECW narrative, rather, you made the on-screen new owner in a massive sort of Stephanie McMahon. So you essentially had Paul Heyman join Stephanie McMahon and Shane McMahon to form as what we came to know as the Alliance. But even bringing ECW, the playing field was not even. And the reason why they brought in ECW is because you had so many former ECW guys, predominantly Rhino and the Dudley Boys, along with guys like Tajiri and Taz, already under the WWF umbrella, already on their roster. So not only did you have a lot of these guys at the ready, but it would also make it an easier transition. But even at that, in terms of the top end guys, you didn't have that on the side of the alliance. And the biggest stars you really had from WCW were Diamond Dallas Page and the WCW champion Booker T. So the only thing leading into the WCW, into the Invasion pay-per-view rather, that helped the Alliance and the WCW was the fact that at this time you had Triple H out with injury and The Rock out with uh, a quote-unquote suspension, but in reality he was filming The Scorpion King, his first ever movie in a leading role. So on the WWF side, you had the likes of The Undertaker, Kane, The Big Show, Chris Jericho, Kurt Angle at the top of the WWF side because you also had a guy like Chris Benoit who was out with injury but even at that it they were still struggling to tell compelling television and a compelling story and the way that they tried to garner our attention was by talking about how Stone Cold a recently heel turned Stone Cold Steve Austin was not the guy he once was And leading into this pay-per-view, you had Stone Cold refusing to go back to the way he was because because of Vince McMahon who was pleading with him, with pleading with Austin to go back to the old one, which was crazy to hear. Who would ever thought that finally under Vince McMahon's thumb, now Stone Cold would be being asked by the very own Vince McMahon to go back to the way he was in the late 90s. Stone Cold refusing which ultimately left WWF being run roughshod over by the Alliance. And that was all right before we got into the Invasion pay-per-view on one of the go-home episodes on Monday Night Raw, when WCW and ECW were absolutely steamrolling over WWF. Like WCW, 
So Stone Cold comes out to just an absolute eruption from the crowd and comes out to save the WWF from a WCW and ECW beatdown. And look, even without Stone Cold, it did seem a little, I guess, unrealistic that the WWF was unable to win without Austin on its roster or on its team. But it obviously made for a massive pop and a massive story heading into the pay-per-view. So the pay-per-view would start on Sunday Night Heat, because if you've been watching wrestling long enough, you had Sunday Night Heat as the Sunday Night Show, obviously, that would be recorded before Raw. So on Sunday Night Heat, Chavo Guerrero of the Alliance would defeat Scotty Tuhati of the WWF for them to go up 1-0 in 6 minutes and 43 seconds. Then the original pay-per-view starts with Edge and Christian defeating Lance Storm and Mike Awesome in 10 minutes and 10 seconds. Then you get Earl Hebner versus Nick Patrick in a referee versus referee match with Mick Foley as the special guest referee that went just over or just under three minutes rather. Then in a tag team versus tag team champion match, you have the APA Brad Sean Farouk defeat Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare in six minutes and 48 seconds. Then in the WCW Cruiserweight, Billy Kidman would face off against the WWF Light Heavyweight X-Pac in 7 minutes and 7 seconds that would have would, that would result rather in the victory for Billy Kidman and then you would have Raven of the Alliance defeat William Regal of the WWF in 6 and a half minutes. So after 6 matches it is 3 and 3 for both sides. Then in a 6 man tag team match you have Chris Canyon Hugh Morris and Sean Stasiak defeat Albert, Big Show, and Billy Gunn in 4 minutes and 20 match uh, in 20 seconds. Then in the 8th match of the night, Tajiri of the WWF would defeat Taz of the Alliance. And then in the only match that featured a championship on the line and arguably the match of the night, you would have Rob Van Dam versus Jeff Hardy for the Hardcore Championship, with Jeff Hardy coming in as the champion. And obviously, this was a match that probably had a lot of foreshadowing to it without the WWF even realizing what they're booking here. As in an extreme, in well, a hardcore match, extreme rules match, take your pick, you had a match of the night and kind of the coronation of a new star in Rob Van Dam. So I would say that of all the positives to come out of the invasion angle, it was Rob Van Dam because he came in as obviously an ECW guy, at least the common WWF fan didn't really know who he was. And 
uh, he came out winning the only championship on the line at the Invasion pay-per-view. And if you fast forward all the way to the inv- uh, to the end of the Invasion angle, he was a guy who was featured in the 5-on-5 one-year take-all match at Survivor Series 2001. And along the way, he would face off against the likes of The Rock for the WCW Championship. I believe there was a f- uh, triple threat match between Rock, Jericho, and Van Damme for the WCW Championship. I want to say at No Mercy 2001. So all in all, the best... Um, the the best positive or the biggest positive rather to come out of this entire storyline was Rob Van Dam and this was the second la- longest match on the card that went 12 minutes and 40 seconds and then in a match that is really a sign of the times unfortunately we had Trish Stratus and Lita defeat Tori Wilson and Stacy Keebler in a bra and panties match with Mick Foley as the special guest referee Mick Foley was the only match that made this, uh, the only person rather that made this match tolerable as this match went five minutes and three seconds. And unfortunately, we had to see this. And again, like I said, it really is a sign of the times. And then in the main event, we had the Alliance versus Team WWF in an inaugural brawl, which is five on five, but first fall to the finish. No elimination. Just at first pinfall or submission would secure the victory for his team. And the alliance was brought out with Shane McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, and Paul Heyman at their side. And then on the WWF side, you had Vince McMahon accompanying out his team. And when you actually realize who was on each other's team, you really kind of saw the talent discrepancy between both sides. And I just got to stop right there. So, so far on Team Alliance, you have the Dudley Boys and Rhino against The Undertaker and Kane. So, right off the bat, there's a massive talent discrepancy between the sides. And again, Rhino and the Dudley Boys were both WWF guys like not even three months ago. So, it, it was tough here to sell it as both sides colliding. 
when there were so many WWF talents on the WCW side and they were former WWF guys too. So it's at this point, it still kind of felt like the sides truly, truly weren't even. But obviously, had they had The Rock and uh, Triple H at their disposal or all the WCW top end talent would have come over right away, it would have made it for a lot more dramatic and entertaining. But we'll get to my dream teams when we end the show. But as we listen here, more of the later names to each of the uh, teams start to get a bit more interesting. So Kurt Angle, I was talking about, you know, Diamond Dallas Page before, or not Diamond Dallas Page. I buried the lead, guys, but um, I was talking about Rob Van Dam before being one of the more popular or bigger breakout stars of this angle, no pun intended. But I think another guy who really benefited from this invasion storyline was Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle in this match specifically really cemented himself as a main event player in the WWF, both storyline-wise and in real life, because I thought he really ascended to the top of the card and really proved how valuable he was. Because in the absence of guys like Triple H and The Rock, although The Rock would come back shortly after this pay-per-view, and all the WCW guys, Ric Flair and Sting, most notably, who... Uh, Jim Ross just alluded to in that audio clip, like the NWO, like Goldberg, they were really lacking guys to go against a Stone Cold Steve Austin or a Rock or an Undertaker or what have you. And they got that with Kurt Angle. Chris Jericho, another one the, who also came out in that clip, was another guy who really exploded onto the scene during this uh, this storyline. And it was just at least if I could take out some positives was the fact that those bigger names like the NWO and Goldberg and Sting and Flair weren't here for 
was that it allowed guys like Kurt Angle, Rob Van Dam, and Chris Jericho really to blaze their own trail and become main eventers t- before our eyes. One of the sub storylines going into this match was what went on between The Undertaker and Diamond Dallas Page. And Diamond Dallas Page, one of the true WCW guys that came over in this storyline, much like Booker T, the WCW and United States champion. And the storyline was it was that DDP was stalking The Undertaker's wife. So when Diamond Dallas Page came to the ring to join his comrades, a massive brawl broke out before the match could even start because The Undertaker just couldn't wait any longer to get his hands on Diamond Dallas. <laughs> So the match starts in a massive brawl that Stone Cold kind of spearheads as he comes to the ring and really kind of takes out everyone there. And like I said to open, the format of the match made it very unique. A five-on-five contest that had no um, eliminations. One to fall to the finish. So you knew that there would be a lot of extracurricular activities, especially with the likes of Shane McMahon, Paul Heyman, Stephanie McMahon, and Vince McMahon on the sidelines. And eventually and inevitably, the match would break out into a brawl. The Undertaker and Diamond Dallas Page would brawl all the way to the backstage area and effectively eliminate themselves out of the contest. Stone Cold Steve Austin would be attacked on the outside by Booker T, really attacking both of uh, Austin's knees that would have him sidelined for a bit. You had Kane go through a table, Devon Dudley go through a table, Chris Jericho and Rhino sacrifice himself, well, sacrifice themselves to take each other out. And it really came down to an outnumbered situation where you had Kurt Angle in the ring facing off against Booker T and... Bubba Ray Dudley.
So we would see the second installment of the Stone Cold Steve Austin heel turn with WWF doubling down on it. And look, it was awful to see, especially in this type of context of him turning his back on WWF. But you have to understand why they did it. They had the rock on the horizon returning to the company. And without a Sting, without a Goldberg, without a Hogan, without a Flair, even without a Nash or a Hall... It would have made no sense for The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin to be fighting on either side. It would have just made absolutely zero sense and it wouldn't have been realistic because WCW and ECW wouldn't have stood a chance. Now look, if we had a perfect world, what should have the 5-on-5 match have been? Well, it probably should have been something along the lines of Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, The Undertaker, and Kurt Angle versus... Hall, Nash, Hogan, Goldberg, and Fling, or Fling, <laughs> Sting, or Ric Flair. And we just didn't get that because of all the aforementioned WCW guys not being there. So in in a way to compensate for that, they made up with Stone Cold Steve Austin defecting to the WCW, a place that he did start his career, and leading that company over the course of the storyline. So you had The Rock leading one side, eventually with Chris Jericho, and then you had Stone Cold Steve Austin leading the other side with Kurt Angle, who would eventually defect to the Alliance. And another reason they did that is because they simply did not have the horses on the side of WCW or or ECW. But all in all, the Invasion pay-per-view, while underwhelming because you didn't have the the necessary talent to pull it off properly... It was what it was. It was very unique in its own way. And it infamously entailed the doubling down of the Stone Cold Steve Austin heel turn that was ultimately failed, I would say, if we look back on this objectively, and will be kind of remembered as something that the WWF was never able to pull off and something that they would probably like a major do-over on. But anyway, guys, that's all I got for you tonight. I hope you enjoyed the covering of the Invasion pay-per-view from 2001. As always, you can get me on Twitter at AdamMarco25. You can get Matt on Twitter at Wrestling underscore Audio. Or you can email him each and every week for the WWE Podcast Mailbag. Anyway, guys, enjoy your weekend. I will talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com and for all of these shows ad free head over to patreon.com slash wwe podcast until then we'll see you next time